Thank you for inviting me to uh, give this talk. Um, international collaboration and the future of surgical research is a fairly large uh, topic. Um, and um, let's see how this works. And um, I have to admit that I'm no expert in uh, crystal balling. I've been told uh, tongue in cheek that uh, uh, foretelling is difficult, uh, particularly when it involves the future. Uh, but as we approach the future, uh, it may, might as well be the next exit. So I will give a helicopter overview over aspects of international collaboration in surgery, some of the backgrounds and barriers, success stories, uh, some of the strategies involved, the development of collaboration from a surgeon perspective, networks development and capacity building, and some uh, perspectives of how su surgical research may develop further in the future. The global view or the global status of surgery is that um, 11% of the global burden of disease are contributed by surgical conditions. And uh, surgery are called a neglect neglected stepchild of global public health. Globally, about 240 million operations are performed annually. Uh, many of those, or the most of those, are performed in non-elective cases. In the UK, there is a 98% lifetime risk of having surgery. In the US, the average American receives seven operations during his or her lifetime. Patients recruited to trials, however, are very low. In the one California study, they demonstrated that less than 1% of all cancer patients treated for solid tumors were enrolled in some kind of study or trial. So there's a clear discrepancy between the number of patients available and the number of patients recruited to trials. And there's a discrepancy between the answers that we need in surgery and the questions that are being asked. If you look at uh, the global population, which is steadily increasing, and if, if in the view of the world uh, mapper, uh, where you see each country, um, the size of each country contributed by the relative number of inhabitants uh, in each region, you see a, a large a number of the populations live in um, developing areas of the world. Whereas if you look at the number of physicians physicians um, distributed in the same map, you see that uh, those areas of the world that are underdeveloped have the lowest numbers of physicians. And the average number of physicians per 100,000 is about 150 uh, all over the world. And as you can see, there is a huge discrepancy between the developed countries and the developing um, countries. Uh, further so for surgery, because surgeons uh, are outnumbered by physicians by one to five, in some countries by one to ten. Uh, so surgical provision is, is um, not equally distributed around the world. If you look at the, the UN regions around the world, there is uh, a knowledge about collaboration going on. Most evident is the collaboration between the East and West, particularly between North Americas and Europe. There are collaborations within regions such as Europe, uh, but even also in South America and Africa, but very little collaboration, as we know, between the south, uh, southern parts of the world. So there is a need for capacity building. The regions that have the lowest number of collaboration, the lowest number of research, are also the, the areas with the lower, lowest capacity for surgery. And capacity needs to be increased. Here is one way of increasing capacity, uh, probably a solution that is not sustainable, it's not safe, it's, and it's not valid. Um, but the problem that we need to solve in, in the develop, uh, developing areas is uh, tremendous. You may have read stories like this uh, by Runa Begum, who was born, uh, born with uh, hydrocephalus, untreated, and, um, and is not offered management because her father, 26 years old, earns um, a pound 79 pence a day, and it would take him uh, over a year and a half at least to, to pay for the surgery required. This procedure is performed easily in the Western world, it takes about 30 minutes, and costs about 800 pounds, but it's not afforded and it's not available for, for children in the devel developed part of the world. 
This is one of the reasons why we should collaborate to increase um, the capacity. And one group of surgeons have proposed a uh, sustainable way of increasing the surgical capacity to, to, to children and also uh, other surgical disorders in the develop, developing world, where instead of having a hit and run missions, uh, one single focused missions that where you go in and treat patients and you return to your home country, you contribute to build a, a sustainable system of general care we're also teaching faculty, uh, developing an academic culture, uh, uh, and producing all the steps would lead to a much uh, greater surgical capacity that's, that is sustainable in the, in the region. And to do so, we might have to look at the, the pyramid of com capacity building and, and research in an international um, collaboration in a different way. Uh, look at the bottom line of the pyramid as capacity building as the primary initiative that can lead to registry-based data and later on to quality improvement and later on to fostering of clinical tri trials in those uh, areas where this kind of capacity building is, is possible. From a global, global perspective, the, there is a large unmet need of pati patients with surgical disorders and um, a relative or a true uh, shortage of uh, surgeons there. Um, at the same time, many regions in the world see similar disease patterns now, uh, in particular for cancer, cardiovascular diseases, and obesity. So there is a huge potential for large trials to being developed with sufficient power if surgical capacity is present, if academic knowledge is present, and if there is support to do this kind of work. The benefits would obvious, obviously be that you, you will have speedier and larger trials, bigger populations to recruit from, and uh, the, re the results would probably be more valid and more generalizable as um, data will be included from several regions. You have the potential of sharing cost, personnel and facilities, and also in increased success for, for major funding from agencies that will likely be positive towards large um, uh, sufficient trials. And you have the, have the benefit of developing networks for further collaboration if you manage to work across nations. The challenges in clinical research are um, roughly uh, some, in some areas similar between the developed and the developing world. Um, in the develop, uh, developed world, we need to have sustainable and affordable healthcare delivery as our possibilities expand. The, the area of personalized medicine requires more specific resources being put into what is now being dubbed as new technology or nanotechnology or, or, and, and the use of genomic and proteomic and metabolomic um, investigations. Whereas in the de developing world, um, capacity building is, is clearly needed to provide for affordable and sustainable healthcare and also for, uh, for research development. There are also other uh, barriers to, to potential uh, collaboration between nations, uh, being reimbursement issues, uh, legislation, regulation, and patient access to medical devices. Shown in this picture is um, the average time uh, before um, uh, governmental uh, or approval of a medical device is given until the, the, the device is into, uh, given into the patient market. And this is uh, clearly demonstrate there is a huge difference between the, the European markets, the, the North American markets, and there is a difference also between governmental and private funding. By working together in collaboration, one could envision that uh, the future uh, pressure on the governments and the nations uh, would pro provide for equal access to, to medical devices if trials are run within the same uh, regions, of course, across nations. And of course, there are cultural barriers. Uh, the U.S. may view the Europeans as different from themselves um, and not want to collaborate with what they think is the outside world. Um, so. To sum up, uh, many of the barriers to collaboration and recruitment and trials are either surgeon related, it can be patient related, it can be socio-politically related, it can also be methodology, uh, methodology related. Um, and these, these are the things that we need to overcome for the future. Uh, also, surgical trials are, 
are um, uh, constantly being criticized for being poor, for being um, less than perfect organized. Uh, as this, tr this study uh, from last year in the, in the JAXA show that there were several flaws in, in the majority of interventional trials published in surgical journals. Um, the traditional view of the evidence pyramid is the editorial expert opinion based uh, piece being on the bottom and the randomized controlled trials and the systematic reviews being placed on the top of the pyramid. We have to remember that this is a, a way of educating and pointing, um, pointing the opinion of the level of evidence. And uh, there are many pyramids, there are food pyramids, there are all kinds of pyramids. I mean, we might have to think of these uh, evidence pyramids different in the future. Some have suggested that um, rather than a hierarchical method, we, sh we should look at the evidence as circular instead. And particularly for surgery or uh, surgery type of research, um, ways of discovering or rediscovering methodology that applies specifically to surgical problems may have to be taken into account. Being more pr pragmatic about the, the, the randomized controls that are being run uh, may be one solution. Uh, many of the randomized trials tend to be explanatory or, or very specific with strong or narrow inclusion ex and exclusion criteria which uh, decreases the validity of the trials. And I'm not going to go into detail in this busy slide, but it tells you the, the pros and the cons of selecting um, which trial to apply to your research question as a surgeon. Uh, and I think this is the kind of, of um, a knowledge that new surgeons need to be taught uh, to become surgical uh, investigators or surgical trialists. <coughs> So, of course, there are examples of success from the past, um, both in, in, uh, concerning randomized controlled trials and observational trials. In uh, randomized controlled trials, you have, for example, the, the, the CRASH study published in Lancet, uh, the Safe Surgery Saves Life study group published their observational study in the New England. There are recent consensus work um, published by a group of surgeons published in both Annals of Surgery and the gut. The difference about this consensus work compared to the consensus work um, performed in the past is that uh, it was a web-based work that involved over a thousand physicians, um, which included a much greater opinion base than uh, in the past when 10 or 20 expert leaders met and, and agreed on a consensus report. And there are now registry collaboration ongoing, for example, in Europe, uh, a hernia surgery registry, which includes patients from, from uh, 20 different countries. And there are agreements between uh, orthopedic registries in North America, Australia, uh, and Europe to collaborate between their own registries um, in orthopedics. So these are studies that have shown that it is possible to collaborate and to collaborate across types of research and types of um, uh, level of evidence. Uh, everyone agrees that the surgeon needs to be technical um, adapt, has to have knowledge about the disease and non-technical skills to treat the patients. And um, preferably a surgeon should develop these skills within an, acad in an academic framework. But we also know that what surgeons love to do is to operate. And um, if you ask a surgeon what he thinks, uh, how he operates, he said he does it perfectly, I do it my way. And um, uh, all surgeons believe they are in the upper top 10 percentile in, of perf performance. Even if you should ask a uh, health politician, uh, tell, tell him or her that 50% uh, of the surgeons perform below the average performance score, they would be outraged and launch a committee to have that remedy. But we know that most of surgery is performed uh, on an average basis um, without much um, uh, necessarily academic background. And if you ask surgeons of a solution to a problem, you will have two different answers, which both will be correct for the same kind of problem. 
Um, and the surgical bias is probably also why uh, another reason why surgical trials tend to be doomed as poor or not correct in, in the aftermath of the being published. So in addition to learning the right methodology, we need to overcome the biases that are inherent with surgical research. Um, also, when you ask surgeons worldwide, surgeons tend to say they have no time to do research or little or no funding, and this has not improved in the current recession. There are no limited infrastructure in most hospitals or in most institutions. There's a lack of research training and a lack of mentors. And these are also barriers that need to be overcome. So one might ask, what's the benefit of do, doing academic surgery? Where's the beef? What's in it for me? What should, how should you separate the sheep from the goats? Um, again, pointing at the structure of training. So it won't work. The classical way of doing clinical training is from basic to a specialist level and then to an expert level um, uh, in clinical surgery. Uh, if you are involved in basic science, that tend to be blocks of training and blocks of projects that can be easily published as you go along. Whereas for the clinical trialists, the, the planning and execution of a trial may take decades uh, in, in the worst scenario to, uh, to um, be performed and to get the results. So it's important for the future surgeon to academic surgeon to have that in that blended into the clinical profile together with the academic profile in order to succeed as um, as a academic surgeon. So the future academic surgeons should develop clinical and technical skills as surgery becomes more specialized but at the same time be proficient in basic or translational or clinical methodology for surgical research questions. This will probably happen at the some cost of the clinical activity for the surgeon, but uh, the surgeon can be involved in networks for collaboration because good quality research cannot happen in isolation and preferably this should happen early in the career. So the development of networks and trial centers and research hub is it's the next step in international research co collaboration. The Germans have for 10 years now led a study center which has been fairly successful, has achieved trial funding and are now running several randomized controlled trials, primarily though in the German speaking um, area. In the UK, uh, surgical trial centers are now being built, uh, led by uh, trainees, which will train a new generation of surgeons um, that will understand and participate in randomized trials. In Sweden, along the national quality assurement programs, they have launched um, uh, a score system, for example, for colorectal surgery, where the hospitals that include less than 10% of patients in clinical trials uh, are penalized by being subtracted of their points. Um, I don't know if it's um, the carrot or the stick that is the best solution to including, including more patients in trials, but it's definitely another response to the few number of patients that are currently included in surgical trials. So how can we make these um, initiatives that now work in isolation work together in Europe? Again, history and culture uh, probably uh, are barriers that um, prevent us from working together. Um, some more prominent than others, and if you look at Greece, they have maybe other reasons for not uh, collaborating than, the, than the, the British or the Dutch or the Germans. But it's doable. And uh, some organizations that are being um, developed now is um, facilitating such kind of network research. Uh, one is the European Clinical Research Infrastructure Network, which is now being launched um, across Europe uh, and is a organization that tends to or um, is placed there to facilitate the network uh, between trials and trialists uh, across Europe. Uh, most uh, countries are participating in, in one or another level currently and um, the, um, the information or um, uh, the support that trialists can get from there is everything from from information and planning to the protocol process to conducting the trial itself. 
Also, some of the surgical societies are now inspiring or um, um, supporting the, the international trial concept with appointing specialist uh, board members for overviewing international trials. They create trial registries uh, within their societies and they publish uh, trial protocols uh, or portfolios where members can view and recruit their own patients into the trials, such as this uh, published uh, by the ESCP. <clears throat> so I think uh, those are uh, good ways of um, um, increase collaboration and increase in visibility of, of ongoing trials uh, that uh, surgeons should, should take um, um, advantage of for the future. So what about future surgery itself? There are a number of emerging technologies um, uh, going on from stem cells to robotics to uh, nanotechnology that surgeons will uh, be influenced by if not um, uh, lead the research area in itself. There is already now being published the, the, the regeneration and um, the experimental uh, transplantation of um, bioengineered uh, kidneys uh, based on stem cell products, uh, which is now possible in the lab. Of course, stem cells are pluripotent and omnipotent cells, which we just, as we uh, know now, have no complete control over. Uh, and they might develop into all kinds of cells. Uh, what we are afraid of in, in the humans is development of cancerous cells, of course, uh, from, um, from normal um, tissue. Um, the surgical uh, uh, researcher will be involved in translational research and should be uh, directly connected to the surgical questions uh, that needs to be addressed in this area. It's a complex, complex field uh, with a need for collaboration between a number of disciplines, but I think the surgeons should be in the center of the research and not uh, only delivering the, the tissue uh, to be investigated. We need and, to wrap up, shall we? Yep, and we, we might see new technology for the near future that, will, that directly influence a surgery or how we perform surgery, such as um, imaging of um, tissues in a new way. Summerscale told uh, a bit about the uh, internet and social media. I will go to quickly through this. Social media is, is changing the landscape that we work in. We are probably not aware of how this will directly influence surgery as a, as a science, but it's already being there. E-medicine, e-surgery, e-health is um, developing rapidly. The, the paper journal of the past is gone. The new uh, areas, the e-journals, with the possibility to connect between different centers, uh, creating um, hubs that can gather information across the globe. We will probably see new technology that we cannot envision yet, as of yet, how it will influence surgery and surgical research and possibilities, possibilities to, to there. We know that the patients will have a greater influence than in, in the past. Each decade has its own research agendas, and the, the current research agenda is to putting the patient in, the, in focus. The patient wants to get involved, and currently there is a, a patient-centered outcomes research institute being launched in the USA with uh, a number of uh, clinical da database, database research networks uh, collaborating with uh, 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 patient-powered research networks, uh, where the patients are actually allowed to put um, their opinion into the clinical work being done. So briefly to sum up, the future will be technology and biology driven and the surgeon should be in the, in the middle of the, the technology and research being done. Health service research will be uh, uh, instrumental both from the developed and the developing countries. Patient oriented and patient driven research will be the focus for the next decades. Education should be instrumental to, to uh, evolve uh, the modern surgical scientists. And uh, we should focus on e education of research method methods that apply specifically to surgical questions. And uh, this also involves development of international networks and, and uh, trial hubs with increased international collaboration. Thank you. Thank you.